Yeah, and, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head in that you're the type of person that can really uh, effectively manage all of those emails. There may be a lot of people out there that uh, can't do that. And this job's so overwhelming. They mm-hmm. them, they, yeah, yeah. They, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I've I've worked with people who have been recruiters, and a lot of them don't fit that mold. They can't they can't do it. Yeah. Um, so how how would people? Uh, what are some of the things that people should do to get a recruiter's attention? You know, what what should you do when working with sure. a recruiter? Uh, there's a there's a fine balance. Um, one of the things that I think is absolutely necessary is is if you're going to have a, a long term relationship with a recruiter, you need to know what that recruiter's business is. You need to know who their clients are, what types of people that they they place. Um, you know, my my client base is mostly mid sized companies, and a, a lot of the jobs that we uh, service are uh, software engineering type jobs. I do web developers. I do um, database developers, uh, uh, ETL type work. I also get into some business uh, uh, analyst type work. Um, we have a lot of companies that are in the digital media business. Our biggest client is VML, and they're an international digital advertising firm. If anybody's heard of them, and so I get a lot of business down of VML. So if VML is a target for you. Um, you just need you need to communicate with me, and I can tell you, okay, yeah, you might fit into this, or I can deliver some bad news <laughs> and tell you, yeah. here's some things you probably need to be be researching and 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 be ready. Uh, it's it's a very difficult client to get people into. They um, probably take about one in eight to ten um, candidates that we send them. It's 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 a tough tough place to to break in, but once you're in, you're in. Um, it's kind of like Garmin in that sense. Garmin's the same way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't do business with Garmin, so I can't can't uh, um, say that with certainty. But I hear a lot of, of stories from people. Anyway, um, well, so, so you, said, you need to know who their clients are. And if, if how do you do that? Uh, how how do you find out? Ask them. Okay. Ask them. Because, and again, I don't know if this is just me. There's. There's a mentality that I think is a very old school mentality. This is 2011, and the amount of information that's available to us as job seekers, as as uh, um, employers and competitors, is is higher than it's ever been. And to try to play your cards so close to the vest that you're not being open with your potential customers, which is the job seekers, if you're a recruiter to not be open with your potential customers. And I'm going to assume that if I'm open with you, you're not going to run across the street to uh, to my competitor and say, here's everything, and debrief with my competitor. Um, I, maybe maybe this is naive, but I trust people. And, and so um, I think that when you're looking for a recruiter, look for somebody that's going to be open with you. Um, and And they may not talk to you about specific clients during the initial phone call, but if you take the time to go in and sit down with meet and meet with someone and they're taking the time to do that, I think you need to have a frank conversation about who their customers are, what type of of people they they uh hire, and make sure you've got a fit both short and long term. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um what are some of the mistakes that people make? Are there um, certain things that, that people need to avoid or or maybe uh common mistakes that you see people make in dealing with you or any recruiter? Sure. I, I think I, I'm not going to say these are mistakes, um, but some of the things that I think um, I think uh, job seekers have an expectation that the recruiters are going to get them a job, uh, and that happens about 10% of the time in my case. If you come in and talk to me, I'm, I'm about 1 in 10 in, in placing somebody. Uh, the thing that you'll get from me is you'll at least get communication both now and down the road until you're tired of listening to me. I'm going to communicate with you. We have – job feeds and we have LinkedIn groups and and we have uh, 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 newsletters and ways of setting up a long-term communication stream with the with the candidates that I talk to and and again you know I'm dealing with hundreds of people every month and so for me to individually say here's what's going on for every single person is tough to do but I try to do it Um, but at least they know what's going on with Riverpoint so there's definitely some responsibility on the job seeker side to uh, maintain uh, whatever uh, communication they can 
with whatever systems that recruiter uses to, to maintain communication. So um, what are some common so mistakes them, that, that – Well, ask, so ask them what type of communication they like, you know, yeah. whether it be phone or email, yeah. um, even a text, uh, yeah. and also um, how often. I mean, how um, often should somebody contact you without being a nuisance? Good, good question. Um this is this is what I instruct my recruiters to do. If somebody has come in and interviewed with us, and they are part of what I call a near uh, a near future opportunity, so I might have something for them in the next 30 to 45 days. I want the recruiter. I want the recruiter to contact them at least once a week just to see what's going on. I don't think there's anything wrong if if there. It sounds like there's some close opportunities for um, the job seekers to to ping back once a week. Um, for a month or two after a, a, a personal meeting. Um, if that recruiter is not being responsive, that tells you that they're probably not interested in you and, and have moved on to different things, and you can go find somebody else to work with that, that will be more engaged in the process of trying to help because that really that should be the recruiter's job is to try to help in whatever manner they can, even if it's not directly employing the person. It's, it's providing them with weeds and ideas and things like that. So um, once a week, I think after after a meeting for a month or so. After that, thirty every thirty days is fine. Oh, okay, okay, about once a month then. Yeah. All right, and and we've got a couple questions that came in online. One of them is what, and it's a good question. What are the three main qualifications for that the recruiter's client, which is the employer, is looking for in general? Do you have some some general ideas of of what employers are looking for? People, yeah, that's a that's a tough question to answer. The top three uh, um, companies uh, have to do more with less now, and so I think um, the ability to adapt and be diverse is very important. Um, you may be charged with uh, a particular task or piece of the business, but your ability to look beyond that and and contribute beyond that, I think, is very important. Personality is probably anywhere between 35 and 50 percent of every hiring decision, and wow. you, uh, I'm, you can't change yeah. that, <laughs> you know, because right. when you have right. when you have six or seven people that are similarly qualified, think about this. You've got people that have very similar credentials. How do you change? How, how do you make a decision? And and so personality becomes a very important piece of it. Um, I'm a very um, outgoing, uh, outspoken person, and and I would not fit well in a team of more. Um, what's, a, what's a good way to put this? Uh, more, I would not fit more in a more conservative environment. I would I would not work well in a conservative environment. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I've also got another question here should you have more than one recruiter and if so why a good I mean, question you, that is a you be great loyal? question yeah should you be should, loyal to should, one recruiter how many girlfriends can you have <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so here here's here's the way uh you should work with recruiters um if you're working with recruiters and know who their clients are um, that gives you uh, information on who else you should be working for. I have no problem if somebody's working with two or three other recruiters because I can't cover the whole city in IT. And so if there's other recruiters, and obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm referring people to other recruiters, so I'm okay with them working with other recruiters. Here's what I don't like when, when they're working with other recruiters. Um, if a job comes up and uh, XYZ, uh, recruiter calls you out of the blue. You've never talked to this person, don't know them from Adam, and they say, I've got a job at, I'm going to say VML because that's my biggest client. Um, I've got a job at VML. Are you interested? If you have been talking to me and I've been talking to you about VML for the past three months, you have to say, I'm working with Riverpoint on that. Um, even though they, they called first, you've got a relationship in place. And I know people that play the first uh, first come, first serve game. I don't play that game, and if that is the game they want to play, I will let them play it with other recruiters. So that's one one of my biggest pet peeves. Um, yeah. The other thing that you want to do is is not um, – you have to maintain control of your uh, uh, resume and, and 
by by that I say when you're working with a recruiter, make sure they're not sending your resume anywhere without your explicit permission. And I would actually I, I exchange emails with candidates before we send our re, a resume anywhere because there are times where other recruiters will pull a resume off uh, an internet site and send it to a client without ever even calling the person. And the reason that that's bad is that that person can then not talk to the, the company directly and become a direct hire. Is that right? Um, that's one of them. Um, the other one is if, if it comes in from from two sources, a lot of times companies don't even want to deal with the hassle because now you've got two companies that potentially have, quote, rights to represent that person. And and so why would we deal with that person when we've got four or five other qualified applicants that don't have that hanging over their head? Yeah, so you have yeah. to really you have to you have to trust the recruiter not to send a resume anywhere without talking to you first. And so some of them do that and that it sounds like it's pretty unethical. How do you totally tell unethical. a recruiter from a yeah, how do you tell a good recruiter from a bad one? Mm-hmm. You have to a lot of it is just gut feel. You have to talk to the person and, and get a feel for what you know, what their um what motivates them. Uh, yeah. If they're if they're if they're being coy with their client names, then you, you, you don't know if your resume is going to go. Well, I'd like to submit you to a major telecommunications company here in Kent, over the park. Yeah. Um, yeah. If they're playing coy, then they're looking out for their best interests rather than looking out for the combined interest of what what the job seeker has and the and the recruiter has. I mean, our our interests should be in concert with one another. They should not be in conflict with one another. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, And going back to contacting a recruiter initially, how do do people get you to call them and keep calling them, and how do they get your attention? (laughs) And when they call you, how should they structure that phone call? You know. Each person is different. Each recruiter is different. Yeah. I told you I'm I'm kind of out there. I mean I I am a uh, I'm a disciple of the twenty twenty first century, and I I just think that uh, all this. So uh, you would prefer email? I I like email, Twitter. You can contact me through my website. Uh, you can text me. You can do all sorts of stuff. Um, but it, it's not so much. The method that you use to contact me, it's, it's how you approach me. If you call me up and say, hey, Dave, um, I found you on LinkedIn, and I went to your website. That's cool. I love your, I love your video. I, I understand you went to Next Door Pizza. I love that place. If, it, there is so much information out there about Dave Templeman that you can research. Yeah. If, you, if you call me up and just give me a, a, a giblet of that, um, it, you're doing more than 90% of the people that call me up because – um, most people just call up and, and say, I saw a job posted. Okay, great. You saw a job posted. Um, so maybe you saw a job posted. That's great. Uh, go check out my LinkedIn profile, and you can go from there and really figure out who I am and, and figure out the best way to, to approach me. I, I'm a, you know, I'm a teak. I went to the University of Northern Iowa. Sorry, KU fans. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I blog and, and, and I have all, you can find out all my interests at, at, in all sorts of different places and I bet 85% of the people that want to talk to me have, we have some common connection somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So if you can figure out what that, that is. For, do you think that works for other recruiters? It, it might, it might not, I don't know. I think if you're going to contact, if you're going to contact recruiters, I think if